Thank you, Hagid, because uh, that was a great segue. <laughs> Firstly, my slides are even more simple. <laughs> Secondly, I'm going to talk about the bronze medal winner, which is government interventions. My perspective is uh, public policy. Uh, and uh, specifically today, I will be discussing uh, access to data for research in the health sector. So we're narrowing down into more and more specific uh, use cases and, and my attempt is to learn from what I've seen the past few years as attempts of governments to intervene in this space and to try and create regulatory mechanism that allow for uh, uh, access to data for research. And this correlates with the right to research firstly um, well, I'll, I'll get to that later, but I'll, I'll start by saying that this is a, quite a complex, for me at least, uh, regulatory and, le and legal uh, um, discussion because it involves two separate sets of laws. So we have uh, all of the laws in the health sector that have to do with research, biomedical research, uh, uh, interventional research to do with the human body. Uh, we start with Helsinki and, and onwards, and we have patient rights laws, and we have other legislation that applies in the health sector, on health institutions. And then, because we're uh, in the data space, we also have the whole host of data laws, data regulations whether it's the privacy protection laws, GDPR and the likes in the EU, and other more specific regulations that apply. And then we have a mix of laws that need to correlate with each other. For example, both discuss consent. We have informed consent in the biomedical interventional research. Uh, no one would think of conducting a human intervention clinical trial without informed consent, shouldn't think about it. But when we move into the data space, the GDPR, which is known as the golden standard currently for, for data protection, has up five other additional legal bases for the use of data. So it's possible to not be only based on consent under the data protection legislation, while consent is very much uh, expected and, and the default in health data research. So how do we combine all of this and how does that work and what is government doing in order to try and facilitate uh, research? So firstly, there are preliminary conditions that are required in order for us to be able to access data. So it has to be available. It has to be present. We need to have digital systems, digital uh, interfaces, digitized data, uh, and it's mentioned of quality and standardization so we can collect it and augment it and use it in, in a meaningful way. And we need governments to have competencies that enable them to do something in this space. Oh, sorry. Um, so from a, a purely administrative law perspective, government cannot do whatever, they, whatever it wants. It needs competencies, it needs powers, authority to do something interventional in any space. So what are the competencies of governments in the health sector? <coughs> so and this is still in, in, in form of background. Where is the big data in the health sector located? And that's a very important question, both in order to figure out where do we go to search for the data, but also who controls and is able to say whether they are willing or unwilling to give access to the data, and under what conditions do we need to pay for it? Who do we allow access to the data? Industry, academia, everyone. Uh, do we allow access from other countries into our country, or do we just restrict it to entities within this country? So, generally speaking, and, and these are the big Entities holding data, ministries of health themselves collect and aggregate a lot of data in the health space in order to do their policy work, in order to uh, sometimes give services themselves that all of that data is being uh, uh, collected at, at the ministries of health. We have nas other national health agencies. We have health management organizations or sick funds or Kupat Cholim in Israel. And these are entities that hold uh, troves of, of health, personal health data. 
Some places we have insurance funds, so in Israel we're used to the HMO being the insurer and the healthcare <coughs> giver together, but in many other places the insurance funds are separated from the healthcare providers. They hold a lot of the data, a lot, a lot of the data that is being transferred between them. The hospitals themselves, the test labs, the welfare institutions, uh, um, nursing homes, uh, old folks homes, lots of data being uh, uh, created and collected there. Pharmacies, thank you, and Army. Army uh, it provides uh, medical, ser ser medical services to everyone who's enlisted. In Israel, universities, do they? No. Mm -hmm. do, do any universities give health care? No, 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 that's no, for sure. No, no. Uh, the prison system. It, prison system as well. So all of these places are places where data resides. And looking at government thinking around this topic and also OECD uh, reports and guidance and others, uh, WHO, there are several um, major goals that we're trying to achieve while devising these types of inter interventions. We want to create equal access. So for example, industry should not have uh, any uh, uh, preference over academia. We want academics to be able to access health data and if uh, we have a barrier that is, for example, money, whoever holds the data requests payment for the use and academia may not have the resources, then we want to correct that situation to enable academics as well as industry to access the data. We want privacy and security because when we allow access to pers very sensitive personal health information, we want to make sure we have very strong privacy and security safeguards all around this uh, type of, of uh, uh, exercise. And you can, uh, you can already see how these uh, goals start to interact with each other and sometimes interfere with each other. Because as we take the bar up on privacy and security requirements, those are uh, starting to maybe um, interfere with equal access to all of the academics, all of the researchers, all of the independent citizens perhaps that want to participate. And if we have a fee to, to, to start playing because we need privacy and security safeguards that are costly, then we already need to balance something here and we, we have a potential conflict. We also want to protect public benefits. We want to make sure that if we are intervening on a national level with this type of uh, uh, health data, making that available to whomever researcher asks for it and we decide is, is uh, worthy of, of getting access, we want to make sure that the public benefits from the use, from the research, from the use of the data. And we want to make sure again that the benefits is, is equal that even if people are not in the research, they will still get to benefit from the results, and, and et cetera. So it's a complex type of, uh, of uh, uh, matrix that we need to start calibrating and see uh, where, we, where it gets us. So this is two models of government interventions that I've looked at in the past years. Uh, the first one, the government-driven one, is a bit older, started at around 2016 uh, around the world. We have various uh, governments already have rules in place or have bills and attempts in place in order to start and try and, and, and uh, make this happen and I will describe how this works. And we have the patient-driven type of intervention, which is uh, relatively newer. In Israel, it's a bill that was just introduced this year. Uh, in the United States, there's a, a, a something that happened in 2020. I'm going to go over that uh, shortly, just to make sure. And so the first model works like this. I think uh, I would characterize it as a centralized model. So government, on a national level, decides that it's a good idea to allow uh, access for research in the public interest. And public interest needs to be defined and, and checked, but for the public interest. We want to make this access available, and, and therefore we create laws that firstly create an approval process. So there would be a place where any group of researchers could apply to get access to data. They will need to demonstrate public interest in the research. They will need to uh, be vetted that their credentials and their academic institutions that back them and the resources that uh, they have for this are, are, are uh, 
strong. The government itself is cataloging available data sets in, in the various places and institutions, like I mentioned before. In some cases, they also collect the data sets. This doesn't happen in all countries. So the Finland model is we do the centralized application process, but then you need to go over to all of the institutions and collect the data that you want and arrange for payment with them, and that is your problem question how uh, uh, efficient that is for, for the goal that we set. In other places, governments are collecting data sets, and uh, like in France, at the France Health Data Hub. Uh, the EU, which was mentioned, the, the EU data space, is about creating this space where data is collected and then access is granted. It has security and privacy, various circles of, of safeguards, and also an offering of a virtual computing environment. So researchers can come into this virtual environment, get access after they went through the process, and then they can benefit from also, also from tools and uh, software that is present there on the platform. This is uh, one set of, of uh, intervention that has been going on, as I said, from 2016 until today, attempted in various places around the world. I'm, n I'm not aware yet of data of how successful it is. I know there were obstacles along the way in implementation. Three things to highlight here. This whole process is based on a waiver of consent. People do not consent to the use of their data. This has been something very controversial for many. And, but the government process replaces the consent. Under GDPR, this is under the legal base of uh, national law that allows access under conditions. So this is without <coughs> consent of the people. There, there's an option to opt out of the, of the framework, but it's not uh, informed consent like we're used to in medical research. The data is, is under uh, de-identification. Various methods of de-identification are required and, and implemented here. Sometimes, uh, most times, by the governments themselves. And this is very costly and very complicated, so there's an added value here for the government doing this uh, on its own budget. And it's very specifically uh, for research purposes. This whole scheme is meant to be in the research space. Moving over quickly to the patient-driven one, the new one. This is a very different type of uh, intervention. This is firstly data portability in the health space or open health. This is firstly an or a, a scheme that is meant to create digital infrastructures that allow us, the patients ourselves, to port our health data, whether it's because we want to move to another <coughs> provider and we want to take our medical file with us, or we want a second opinion and we want to send over test results and, and medical information. This is firstly driven by the empowerment of patients themselves. Obviously, it's consent-based, so not uh, a waiver of consent, but consent-based. Data will only be ported if the patient themselves ask for it after being identified, etc. Again, uh, um, security and privacy in the scheme, and you can see that in the Israeli uh, bill that was uh, circulated a while back, a huge difference, the data is identified because the patients themselves, after having been identified, are porting the data. Now, porting the data may mean that they can give also uh, consent to research, but it's not the, the, the primary purpose of the whole scheme. The purpose of the scheme is data portability. The, sec the secondary, one of the secondary purposes is making data available for research, but this relies on the consent of the, of the people themselves, of the patients. There are multiple purposes to this framework, but the data will remain identified unless later on in the process, whoever, whichever third party gets the data anonymizes the data. So this is quite different from uh, the other space. And it comes because this is riskier to privacy, and to, to security of, of people's data, it comes with a government licensing scheme. So if you're a third party that wants to be able to offer people to give, your, to give their data for whatever purpose, whether it's uh, management, uh, disease management application services, or it's testing services, or it's research, if you're willing to do that, then the government licenses those third parties and, uh, over, and, and provides the oversight in order to, to maintain safety. So 
Good. In the United States, quickly, um, population 330 million, public health insurance 35 percent. So 180 million medical profiles are available through the public system. Why is this important? Because government has authorities, competencies, power over public health institutions, not on private institutions. So this is easier to try and create an intervention. And in the United States, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, um, and, and, and the Veteran Affairs uh, constitute the public health system. So we have quite a lot of uh, data there that may be accessible. So jumping over, uh, over HIPAA, over uh, uh, HITECH, the 21st Century Cures Act includes a provision. It was meant, firstly, to accelerate, again, the sharing of data, the empowerment of citizens to, uh, to being able to get their own data, uh, delivery of data within the health sector between health organizations and all of other all of the other institutions. But one, thing, one of the important things is there's a prohibition of information blocking. So the rule is that the holders, carriers, handlers of the data are not allowed to block the porting of the data, not allowed to block the information from traveling. It's not exactly a right to research. It's not exactly an explicit way of saying we want to make data accessible for research and therefore we're creating this rule. But there is writing and research and discussion in the United States between scholars and trying to engage the government on the question whether this actually constitutes a right to research, a right to access for, to, to data for research. And just to sum up for Israel, when I started looking at this, I said, well, Israel and, and the United States are so different. Our health system is, is central, universal. We have a population of nine and a half million, 100% public health insurance. So it's, it's very different from the United States. But in this perspective, it's quite similar. Because both in Israel and in the United States, you can currently conduct health data research investigations, either under HIPAA, or under, in Israel, under the patient's rights law. So we can uh, arrive at access to data, but both of them are reliant on internal review boards within the health institution. So the data is siloed. Basically, if you are able to convince Maccabi, or able to convince uh, Duke University Medical Center to give you access to data, and you can negotiate an agreement with them, then that will give you some bit of data from a silo, but not the whole uh, space, not big data. So in Israel, the same uh, uh, applies at the moment, but this new bill by the government uh, just circulated um, mm -hmm. creates this whole uh, structure that is meant to facilitate access to data for research. So thank you very much. Thank you.